Digital twins refer to the merger, the fusion between uh, theoretical models of some kind of dynamic what's going on and, and empirical observations of the reality of what's going on. And if that sounds a lot like what science does with theoretical and empirical science, yes. So <laughs> digital twins are actually the digitalization, the algorithmification of what science does. They are extremely important, not only for, for science, but also in the industry. They are digital twins of all kinds of machinery of people. There's a digital twin of you and me in the big Silicon Valley company. So digital twins, basically these digital copies, they're all around us. And they're extremely important to understand if you want to understand the knowledge part of the digital age, because the knowledge that's what we play with is not done in analog reality, but in the digital copy, in the digital twin of you and me in the Silicon Valley companies or of the digital copy of a company or of a city or of an entire country. So let's talk about digital twins because they're extremely important. What are models then, theoretical models? Theoretical models are abstractions of reality. They are a simplification of reality. That's why all models are wrong, because reality is much more complex. You couldn't include everything into your model. You see what matters to you and you come up with this kind of toy model. Now, from this same very complex reality, as somebody else could have come up with a different model. Now, is this model wrong? Yes, it's not. Reality, is this model wrong? Yes, it's not reality. Actually, turns out that all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> and this might be useful to me, and this other one might be useful to you, and, and that's just that. So if you wanna learn more about modeling, and this space you can think about it as game theory on steroids, for example, you try to model a dynamic, I strongly I encourage you to check out the, the course of model thinking from professor and colleague Scott Page. And I also have a little course on computer simulations up on Coursera, which you kindly invited to check out, where we do agent-based computer simulations. So we, we grow artificial societies from the bottom up. We don't care really about empirical data of what society is. We just think about like, what societies would we like to have? A better world, for example. And, and you will grow your own there, your own societies there. You will code them up yourself and play with it. It's like it's like playing a video game, honestly. It's, and it's as much fun too. But back to here, all models are wrong. Why? Because none of them represents reality really. Because the only working model of the universe is a universe. In this case, it would be this universe. But it's extremely inconvenient to have a universe on your desk. <laughs> That's why we simplify and we don't, like, we don't include everything. We only include what really interests us. And then we make it really simple and then we have a model. And, but since you don't include everything, there is in chaos theory, the so-called butter butterfly effect. Chaos th theory taught us that. Because you might have forgotten to include a butterfly on the other side of planet Earth that flaps its wing. And because it flaps its wing, a little air comes and this little air it merges together with some other kind of little air and that becomes a bigger air. And then this becomes a bigger air and at the end it comes a tornado which on the other side of the globe destroys whatever what. And where did the tornado come from? Why didn't you see that coming? Well, because if the butterfly wouldn't have been, then it, it, it very unlikely would not have happened. You, you cannot include every butterfly effect into your model. So that's why all models are wrong. However, can we get closer to the idea, right? Is the only working model of a universe maybe a digital universe? Can we model as good as we can things that are going on? Maybe we can even include the butterfly. If we have a big enough computer model and we have a huge computer simulation and who knows, some people say we're already living in a simulation and who, who would know? Right, so we don't know, and that's basically where this, you know, that's the kind of thinking we have when we, when we talk about digital twins. So let's start slowly. Traditionally, these computer simulations come from models, from computer models. For example, in engineering, this is basically a design plan of a house, 
and you can model the different steps of the building. Or uh, this here captures the equations of the weather, this model, or a forensic facial reconstruction of some historical figure. So we have used these kind of models, these theoretical models for a long time, and we equilibrate, equilibrate the model with some empirical data to make sure it reflects something, but it's still just a computer simulation based on a model. So a computer model is some equations or algorithms that capture the behavior. That's how the weather does what it does. And the computer simulation is then you run it and, and see what you get. In 1993, a very influential book has been published by David Galanta, which is called exactly that, Mirror Worlds, or the day software puts the universe in a shoebox. How it will happen and what it will mean. So that was in 1993 and what Galanta told us there in the prologue is, this book describes an event that will happen someday soon. You will look into a computer screen and see reality. Some part of your world, the town you live in, the company you work for, your school system, the city hospital, will hang there in a sharp color image. Abstract, but recognizable. Moving subtly in thousand places. This mirror world, he called it, you're looking at is fed by a steady rush of new data pouring through the cables. Mirror worlds will transform the meaning of computer. Our dominant metaphor since the 1950s, uh, thereabouts, is the electronic brain. It will go to the ports. Instead, people will talk about crystal balls, telescopes, stained glass windows, wine, poetry, or whatever. Now we talk about digital twins, and that's what makes it vividly. So what are the mirror worlds? They are software models of some chunk of reality, some piece of real world going outside, going on outside your window, oceans of information, pour endlessly into the model. And that's the idea now we go then towards the digital twin. So we have, we mirror something of reality. While computer models capture the dynamic of, of the system uh, and computer simulations run it, digital twins include additionally a two-way flow of information between the simulation that runs and reality. So a digital twin, call it mirror world. I don't know where digital twin caught on and not mirror world, but it's used a lot. For example, in industry, check out this little example to see how in an in industry, they basically don't risk to really intervene in the industrial machinery. They basically play around with a mirror world with a digital twin of their very expensive equipment. The very important distinction here is that's a two-way flow of information. So it's not a video game. That's the distinction between a digital twin and a video game. For example, here, a very important digital twin, <laughs> beer brewing. And you can hear basically, well, it could be a video game. It could just be a video game of beer brewing. And then you can do that and that's fine. Now, if you use it interactively with a real beer brewing activity, and you equilibrate the model back and forth, two-way flow of information. Well, actually the bitterness turned out like this and I measured it and then how could I, and then you fine tune and then you don't have to waste a batch of hops. Basically, what you do is you just play around with your model until you think like, okay, now I'm ready again to waste another batch of hops and see if I finally get it to taste like something. So then you go back and forth with it. So that's the idea of digital twins and that makes them so powerful. Now, they do come out of games, no doubt about it, because it's actually the other way around. So games have for a long time been computer simulations, and we slowly but surely are migrating our video games as well towards digital twins. These simulations have not been only very important to, to some kind of professions, also for all of us. Actually, the most popular video games are actually not games. They're actually Simulations. People love to simulate something in reality. So if you look at the best-selling Nintendo Switch video games ever, you see that on number one, there's a racing game, Mario Kart, a racing game. And on two, there's a social simulation, Animal Crossing, of an island, you know, survive on an island. So you simulate something. I mean, the really like, you know, fantasy third-person shooter games or whatever, or a action role playing, I mean, they are way down here. The people love much more to actually simulate something that has to do with reality. Or here, the other one, very popular game, it's basically you simulate 
playing Lego <laughs> on Minecraft on a digital scale, on a much bigger scale, you can do that then and create like Lego worlds that you could have never imagined. Or take the other one for younger audiences, Roblox. Extremely popular video game, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. You saw here that it, it, that's when the COVID-19 pandemic started and you see, saw how it exploded. All the kids, 80% are under 16 years old, were staying at home playing Roblox. And Roblox is a platform where you have 40 million different games and you can play it there in this, we call it Metaverse. And you know what's the most popular game? Yes, you're right. It's a simulation. Actually, it's called Adopt Me and you like, Okay, you simulate adopting a pet. So uh, people love that. Now, none of this is attached to reality as it is. So if you migrate towards a digital twin, we have to start to mirror what's going on in reality and create a digital twin of something that really exists in the reality, in the analog reality around us. And also our video games are slowly but surely or like certainly starting to merge together with real-time data, basically with this two-way information flow. Maybe the best, call it metaverse, call it digital twin or what it is, it is the famous flight simulator that Microsoft has and the Microsoft flight simulator is its 40th anniversary. So that's what it looked like in 1982. It's the longest running software product line for Microsoft. It even predates Microsoft Windows by, by three years. And you can see in the flight simulator, it's actually amazing what you can do. It has the map of the entire world. It's basically a digital twin. You can fly over your own house in the flight simulator. It's two trillion unique, uniquely rendered trees. Real world, there are three trillion, so it gets pretty close. And one and a half billion buildings. It has real world weather and it meets, you meet real world air traffic. So you might find a plane up there that is really flying across your house right now. And the size of the virtual world is, well, 2.5 petabytes. So you would need uh, 500 laptops in order to store it, but you only store a very little percentage actually on your device, 150. So that is also very important. And we will talk more about that later. If you, that brings us more to the metaverse already into the challenges of it. So here, uh, let me be more explicit. If you would want the entire Microsoft Flight Simulator, where you can fly over your house and, and do all these amazing things. On your computer, you would need 500 laptops, but you don't. You only take 150 gigabytes on your device, that's 0.006% of that total, and the rest you need bandwidth to communicate this two-way information flow from reality, like what airplane is flying out there and what is, what is rendered on your screen right now that has to come through bandwidth. And we will talk about that more later, but we don't have enough bandwidth. And we also don't have enough computational power to make that all work. So there are technical difficulties that we are confronting in this idea, but still the idea, you know, makes a lot of sense of going towards the digital twins. But since you need all this computational power as well, you need a lot of budget. But industries are working on this and you can see here some applications of how digital twins are used in the industries. Here, for example, they design a car and here they design a car, here they design a part of an engine of the car. So you can see here, that's how you nowadays work in engineering. You don't waste your time of stopping machinery and or to really waste some metal or aluminum. You design with a digital twin as good as possible. And once you know what you really want, well, then you go back and really do it, go back or go to reality. And then you feed it back this two-way flow of information between the digital twin, the replica and the real world subject. That's the crux. And that's also the challenge because we need enough bandwidth and enough computational power in order to connect to make this connection. Now the obvious next step is not to only model games or model machines, but why don't we just model all society, like all reality. Let's start with, with society, with you and me. Well, that sounds scary, doesn't it? Well, it already is happening. And we talked about that in a previous lecture, check that out. For example, Amazon, the, the, the giant in the retail market, of course, has a digital twin of you and me and everybody who ever used it. And they also have a digital twin of the consumer behaviors of society and a digital twin of all the products and of all the logistical chain. 
they might own it or might not the, the, the delivery, but that doesn't matter. They have a digital twin of the deliverer who brings these products and of the storage truck that does something with, with, with the inventory. Now, they might or might not own actually the real world thing, but they own the digital twin. They own the knowledge of what's going on there. And there they create, well, the digital twin actually works, lives on this platform, on this digital platform. And here then I have my data and I can do my machine learning and my computer simulations. So I do my empirical and my theoretical work. And that's not only how Amazon's work. We already went through this. You know, Airbnb doesn't really, doesn't own the beds, but it owns a digital twin of the hotel industry, of the hospitality industry. Netflix doesn't necessarily own the content, but it owns the consumer watching habits. Uber doesn't own necessarily own the taxis, but it owns a digital twin of the taxis and the transportation industry. And there's many others. For example, we're starting to create digital twins of entire cities. Here in this publication, you can see, well, you have a digital twin of all the people, then of all the things, of all the networks, the transportation network, the water network, the canalization network, and you create a digital twin. It's a little bit like playing SimCity, just played by mayors and by public officials. And you can see how you could, for example, optimize the city, for example, traffic flow. This is uh, here a simulation of Chicago, also equilibrated with real-time data, basically from cell phones. If a cell phone moves on a freeway, we assume there's a car around it. So that's how we model cars. This is a chemical attack in Los Angeles, which thankfully never has occurred, but we can simulate it. And we have a digital twin in case that would happen. What could and should we do? And this is a simulation here from the US military that have been long pioneering this idea of doing digital twins of their missions, also of the combat missions. And it doesn't stop here. We are creating a digital twin of all Earth. Here, for example, we create digital twins of different layers of our agricultural land. How much nitrates does it have? How much phosphorus? How many rocks does it have? And that's then used in order to algorithmify something like agriculture. Now, that all sounds a little bit futuristic, right? Like, oh, we're going there and we're living there and it already sounds a little, but you know, it goes slowly but surely that we merge the virtual world and the physical world. And you see that just, even if you turn on your good old TV right now, and if you take the most popular sport on planet Earth, soccer, well, there is a digital twin of the goal and of the ball. And this digital twin is used to decide if there is a goal and soccer, for a long time didn't want to have anything to do with this video evidence and whatever, but even they, you know, you cannot stop it. American sports have been pioneering that in, in American football and in baseball and in basketball, but soccer was, but now you cannot. And that's basically here the evaluators that work with the digital twin of what's going on. And this of course doesn't stop. We put entire stadiums now into, call it the metaverse. We analyze different games and, and that's, it's part of the entertainment now to look at the data trace behind of what's happening in a sport, and that becomes part of our entertainment. And of course, science has used that for a long time. Here is a digital twin of Mars that has been pioneered by a colleague of mine here at UC Davis. Check out that little video. For all of our history, there have always been people who are going out to find something new, to understand something new, and to bring those things back home to expand and share culture. That's what science is about. That's what's so exciting. I'm Don Sumner. I'm a professor of geology at UC Davis, and I'm in a virtual reality environment where we can make things like a virtual globe that allows us to investigate things we can't see in the real world. We live in just an instant of time, and the Earth is uh, four and a half billion years old. Looking at rocks and trying to understand how they form and how they reflect Earth's history is, is my job, for example, climate change and sea level rise and uh, earthquake hazards. So each one of these little colored spots represents an earthquake. In California, which we're looking at right in here, most of the earthquakes are pretty close to the surface. We think about ourselves as being an earthquake country, but it's really not as bad as somewhere like Japan. But there are a huge number of earthquakes. This big red one here caused a tsunami. So if we look inside the Earth, you can see that a lot of those earthquakes are below the surface. And that's because part of Earth's ocean crust is sinking down into the interior of the Earth. When the solar system was first forming, Mars and Earth were pretty similar. 
and they've gone very different directions. One of the reasons I'm really interested in going to Mars is to try to understand what the early Earth was like. The nice thing about virtual data is you can put anything you want in here, and I'm interested in looking at data from Mars. So here we are. These are images from orbiters, and we have reconstructed the virtual surface. We're looking at much older rocks than we can typically find on Earth. And if we read the history of those rocks, it will tell us about what happened on early Mars, and that will help us understand what happened on early Earth. But we're hoping that this ridge uh, contains clues to ancient water on Mars, and in particular, we're interested in finding out if it was an environment that could have hosted life. But just to be able to walk down the hall and step onto the surface of Mars like this is a real treat. So we're looking at color pictures of Mars that the Curiosity rover took. The first color image I saw of the, of the distance, uh, it just so beautiful, and it was, I just started crying. There is just something very familiar about this landscape. So we look at the layers, we look at the textures in those rocks, and that tells us the history of how they formed. This is a virtual model of the rover Curiosity at life size. So the images in the background were taken by uh, these two cameras. Those are the first uh, color cameras to take landscape images of, of Mars like this. It's a photo album uh, from another planet, and there's this huge sense of adventure and excitement seeing a, a new place, a place where no human being has ever seen anything before until we get those pictures down. When you reach out beyond Earth, and try to understand things, it, it, it puts, puts our own lives in perspective nicely. And it doesn't stop here. There are efforts in science that aim to model all life on Earth. So every fish, every bird, every, well, we don't know, every insect, we, we really want to make a digital model of the universe. We have to start with Earth first. But you know what the problem there is? It's again, it's this two-way flow of data. So as they say here in this project is the biggest stumbling block is to obtain the data to parameterize and validate the model. Using automated cameras and image recognition, motion activated cameras to catch the puma, continuous plankton recorders towed beneath ships. So you need to, I mean, for, for social recording social data, we are lucky because we, don't need a plankton recorder, we just leave the data for free. The digital footprint, we leave there the digital trace data. So we can simulate society already very well, better than we can simulate nature. Because nature doesn't walk around with recording machines all day long, just like we do. So there's a difference, but that drives only home. My point is that the biggest challenge for digital twins is creating this communication flow between the model and, and between reality. And only that makes it a mirror world, a digital twin.